Uh, I'm not really an ocular pathologist. I'm a general pathologist. I chop up cows and horses and pigs and dogs on a regular basis. And I had some training in ocular pathology when I was a graduate student at Purdue. And I came back to Guelph after finishing my PhD and discovered these misshapen, formless blobs appearing on the slide that the histotechnician swore were eyeballs. And I said, well, geez, that might be. They have a lens, but that's the only vague resemblance to an eyeball as I know it. And so what they were doing to eyes offended my sense of propriety. I, luckily, I mean, they were eyeballs. It could have been rectums, for all I care. It would be the same, the same feeling. And so I began to try to rectify that situation and, and found I got hooked on the subject. And even today, while I, I travel and speak on ocular pathology, uh, in fact, I still occupy a relatively small part of my time, but a large part of my heart, perhaps. So that's why I'm here today. I, I suspect for many of you, the situation is similar to, uh, to people I know at Guelph. They have this interesting necropsy technique where it seems destined, or the whole design of the necropsy is to separate the eyes from the rest of the body, to leave the eyes in the carcass as it gets burned. Uh, which is a remarkable necropsy technique. It's as if they exist as little foreign alien beings that are not to be disturbed for fear of releasing some terrible demon. Uh, after sitting through two hours today, you're not going to become experts in ocular pathology. You may not even develop a love affair with eyes, although I hope some of you will, have, will be motivated a little bit in that direction. But I'd like to remove some of the fear from them. Ophthalmologists have a bad habit. They develop these huge, long Greek words. See, it's all, it's, it's a secret code. And it's destined to make ophthalmologists special so no one else can play in their little pool. And this is not fair. The reactions of the eye to injury are exactly the same as any other tissue. There are a few constraints placed upon that range of reaction because of some anatomic features. But beyond that, the game is exactly the same. If you can do gut and you can do kidney, you can do eyes. Like dermatopathology, however, you can't be a good ocular diagnostician if you don't understand the clinical diseases. And I don't have time today to talk about the clinical diseases. But you cannot diagnose corneal or conjunctival or retinal disease in a vacuum separate from the clinical syndromes that exist in that breed at that age under those environmental circumstances. We make ourselves look like idiots when we try to play generic pathologist when you deal with eyeballs. So if you want to do eyes, you must get into the clinical literature. Your clinical textbooks are your ally. And just like skin, the diagnosis you make must fit into the clinical parameters for that species. The topic today is a comparative ocular pathology. It might be better entitled generic ocular pathology. I mean, when you deal, as I do, with everything from, from fish to elephants in terms of their eyeballs, the range is so great that it's impossible to give a truly comparative lecture. I have a favorite lecture I give on fish eyes, which are absolutely fascinating. Uh, but that would take two or three hours all by itself. So I just won't be able to do that. So all I'm going to do is just give you a, a guided tour of the general reactions of the eye to injury, starting with the cornea and moving on. So with that brief introduction, let's get started. Please ask questions as they come up. I don't mind being in interrupted. I don't have a train of thought anyhow when I speak, so you're not going to interrupt anything. So if we can just uh, dim the lights, we'll begin the first slide. Guess what this is? Yes, this is a retina, not detached, well fixed. How do you get a decent eye section? Maybe just, just a, a couple of s very small hints. Ocular pathologists are renowned for having these huge rituals of how to get a good section of an eye. Nonsense. Okay. The most of the damage to the eye is done by the person who trims in the eye. Any idiot can remove an eye from, from a head. In some species, you kind of remove the head from the eye, like in a bird. But nonetheless, getting an eyeball, getting it absolutely clean and naked with all the muscles gone, drop it in any fixative you want. All of these rituals, but it's got to be Zenkers, it's got to be Buins, it's got to be Carnoy's nonsense. Formalin is fine. Okay. My personal preference is Buins fixative. That is not essential. I happen to like it, but Formalin does a perfectly adequate job. Most of the damage is done when you trim that eye to take the two 
outside edges off to get your central calotte done with a scalpel blade. You cannot use a scalpel blade to trim an eye. Absolute no-no. They are too dull and they're too short. The ideal instrument for trimming an eyeball is a disposable microtome blade. I regularly send one of my graduate students into the histology lab at night to steal uh, microtome blades. They're always complaining they're short of microtome blades. I, sta I have no idea where they went. Okay, 50 cents a piece for microtome blades in some economies, that is a national disaster. Uh, nonetheless, they're what you, sh you should use. Nice and long and very sharp and just take two nice slices off each side of the eye, you'll get beautiful sections. If you have to uh, a grovel in front of the histology technician, so be it. My experience is most histology technicians do have a sense of artistry. And if you show them how beautiful an eyeball section can be and appeal to their sense of artistry, they will actually go the extra distance to make you a good section. But I've taught lots of graduate students to trim eyes, and believe me, it's the scalpel blade and the heavy hand that does the damage. Oh, just incidentally, this, this is an archer fish. This is a fish eye. And oh, it would be fun to spend several hours talking about it. But I'd like to point out one thing to you. Human beings have a very bad habit. We assume we're at the top of the pecking order in Mother Nature's evolutionary plan. This is clearly nonsense. Uh, this archer fish could probably read a newspaper at a thousand yards while swimming backwards and upside down. This is the ganglion cell layer here. Compared to any mammal, this is two or three times as thick as the best we can offer. Much better than a peregrine falcon, for example. A lowly archer fish. This fish sits in the water, sneaks its head above the water, and squirts a stream of water 10 or 12 yards to knock a bug off a leaf. That's how it earns its living. And for that, it has this remarkable ganglion cell layer that is in at least one-to-one -one relationship with photoreceptors. Every single photon of light stimulates a point of recognition. This animal has visual acuity better than any instrument we have yet devised. Fish have lots of other very interesting things. They have no iris that moves. Their iris is immovable. How do they adapt to light, for example? If you put fish in bright light, how do they shield their retina from getting bleached out by all that sunlight? Well, the sneaky devils have pigment in their, in their retinal pigment epithelium that actually is mobile. And in the daylight, you would see a very different looking retina. The, the RPE, the retinal pigment epithelium, will send its processes up to engulf the photoreceptors and shield them from pigment. And at nighttime, they recede. So they play this Venetian blinds game with movement and recession of pigment. Remarkable. All kinds of adaptations like that occur across the animal kingdom, where the eye is suited to the environmental niche in which the species lives. And in fact, the game I play with some of my colleagues who send me fish is they'll send me species without identification. And my game is to predict, is this a deep water or shallow water fish? Is it predator or prey? Was it caught and killed during the day or at night? Or season of the year? And all of these things can be determined just by looking at this retina. And there are examples we could choose from other species, from other, from other phyla even, that are equally interesting. But it's a remarkable study in biology, and I would encourage any of you of any interest at all, pursue that a little bit. It's great fun. Here's a nice section of an, of an eyeball, well fixed. And to some of you, this will strike terror into your hearts. My god, not an eyeball. Who can do this for me? Not me. Anybody else? No problem. No problem. We're going to solve that today, as we speak. I really don't want to get into a review of ocular anatomy. Uh, and I don't want to insult anyone's intelligence, but just maybe very quickly. You like that but? I don't want to, but I will, you see? Just let's remind ourselves, OK? Here's the, here's the naked eyeball, and as it should be when it's trim. No muscles, no periocular tissue. Even the eyelids are gone. You want an eyeball to be dropped into the formalin in this naked state. And this is a dorsoventral section. Okay, the tapetum will be dorsally. The non-tapetal fundus will be ventrally. Okay. Anterior chamber, the posterior chamber, simply between the iris and the zonules of the lens. The zonules will be coming from ciliary processes sweeping up to the equator of the lens. So this area defines the posterior chamber. It is filled with aqueous like the anterior chamber. And this is the vitreous. 
Ophthalmologists have this bad habit of confusing people because they call this the posterior segment and this the anterior segment, and yet within the anterior segment, there is an anterior and a posterior chamber designed to confuse. Aqueous humor produced by a process of filtration and secretion by the ciliary epithelium circulates past the lens, delivering nutrients, removing waste products from the anaerobic lens, circulates out through the filtration angle or the trabecular meshwork and out into a series of scleral veins to drain away from the eye. And that will become very clear because if you're in an ordinary diagnostic practice, the vast majority of eyeballs you will have sent to you are going to have glaucoma. That is the leading cause for enucleation. Glaucoma and tumors are the name of the game if all you're interested in is coping with what's going to arrive in the mail or arrive by whatever means across your desk. We're going to get into a few more things than that, but those are the two biggies, and understanding aqueous is going to be important. One, I don't have time to do ocular embryology. Uh, it's a huge and fascinating field because especially when we're talking about inbred and line-bred animals, ocular anomalies become a very big issue. In purebred dogs, certainly, the first thing I need to know when I get an eyeball is what breed is it, because that opens up a whole Pandora's box of possibilities in terms of the diagnosis of retinal disease or other anomalous form formations. Just all you have to remember, not all you have to, but one of the things to remember in understanding the, the reactions of eye to injury is how it's made. And remember, it begins life as a hollow sphere growing out from the brain. As it approaches the, the fetal surface ectoderm, it will induce a thickening of that ectoderm, the lens placode, which will then bulge inward to form the lens vesicle. And that lens vesicle seems to then act kind of like a baseball being pushed into a basketball. That small sphere pushes its way into what used to be the ocular sphere, this optic vesicle, causing it to involute upon itself. These two layers of neurectoderm will then come into apposition, but they will not fuse. This space always remains as a potential space to fill with inflammatory exudates. This layer is destined to become the sensory retina. This layer is destined to become the retinal pigment epithelium. At their anterior lip, the two of them fuse and bow inward to form the epithelium of the iris. Not the stroma, just the epithelium. So the iris on its posterior aspect retains a double layer of neurectoderm, which then is capable of separating one from the other to form cysts. For example, during inflammatory disease, you will get iris cysts forming. It will then buckle and pucker to form the ciliary processes off the back of the iris. It too retains this bilayer that are simply butted together with no junctions, capable of cystic separation. The retinal pigment epithelium, this single cuboidal epithelial layer, very inconspicuous, often ignored when looking at an eyeball is extremely important in embryogenesis and in adult life. It is the main conductor, orchestrator of ocular development. It sends out chemical messengers to induce the formation of the choroid, induce the formation of sclera, guide the vasculature into the eye, and nurture the development of retina. It has these multi this, this multitude of tasks and many of the ocular anomalies that are so familiar in dogs, cats, rats, rabbits, the defect lies in a defect in the chemical messengers being produced by the RPE. It is also the, the site of attack in a number of very important acquired diseases that we can talk about later. That's all I really want to talk about in embryology because, as I say, the anomalies are so numerous and they differ so much from species to species that it's really not possible in a short time to give you any, any specific detail. I'm going to do a terrible thing, and that is completely ignore the conjunctiva. If you understand the pathology of mucous membranes, you understand the conjunctiva. It's kind of comforting. It's kind of like lymph nodes and spleen. I don't know if you're like me, but my vocabulary of lymph node pathology is three words, hyperplasia, atrophy, and neoplasia. I don't have much more. 
You ever wonder why we always take spleens out of, out of animals? I've hardly ever made a specific diagnosis on a spleen. I don't know why. They get atrophy, hyperplasia, and cancer. Well, what, what conjunctiva does is it undergoes lymphoid hyperplasia, like any mucous membrane that is capable of antigen response. It undergoes squamous metaplasia of its columnar epithelium that is along here. And that's really about all it does. Yes, there are some specific diseases. You know, there are chlamydial conjunctivitis and this and that, but they're not diagnosed by histopathology. They're diagnosed by immunofluorescence or immunoperoxidase techniques. So to me, conjunctiva is a, is a histopathologic desert. It does so few things. Hyperplasia, squamous metaplasia, uh, nonspecific kinds of inflammation that give me virtually no information, and ending up with lymphoid hyperplasia or lymphonodular conjunctivitis, which is the destiny of every chronic conjunctivitis. Since the majority of, col of conjunctival biopsies one will get uh, are from um, animals that have had chronic conjunctivitis that haven't responded to therapy, what you're going to get is, is lymphonodular conjunctivitis etiologically nonspecific. Make up a rubber stamp and just stamp it, you know. Put a computer macro on, save yourself some hassle. I want to talk about the cornea. Anatomic features we'll get to in a moment, but just but low power stuff, okay? The corneal curvature varying with the species. This is the limbus where the jumbled dermal-like collagen of the sclera becomes the very regular laminated collagen of the cornea, where the epithelium changes from a skin-like conjunctiva into the very regular epithelium of the cornea. This line is the limbus, and we'll be using that word frequently. Notice, by the way, the iris sits against the lens. The lens actually supports the iris. One of the clinical correlates of a lens luxation is the iris begins to tremble, and that's because it's no longer lying flat against the lens surface. Just moving ahead a little bit, what this tells you is if the iris gets inflamed and gets sticky with inflammatory exudate, it's likely to stick to this lens shelf upon which it is sitting, and then you're into big problems with glaucoma. Okay, let's look at cornea. Let's get into the meat of this thing. Enough diddling around on the outside of it. Cornea, a trilaminar sandwich. A surface epithelium, okay. very regular, non-keratinized, no pigment, multiple layers varying a lot with the species as to how thick it actually is. In general, it gets thicker with the size of the animal, but that's a generality. Okay. It regenerates itself over about a 10-day cycle. It has a transient amplifying population along the basal layer but if you really damage it, its true germinal population is way out at the limbus. And therefore, if you have severe corneal damage, you're going to have to wait for that population to regenerate at the limbus and slide in. That is why in chronic keratitis, you'll often get pigmentation and keratinization because those cells coming in from the limbus are basically conjunctival cells and they carry with them that genetic memory to make pigment and perhaps lose their regularity. So great regularity, no, no cornification, no pigment. They sit on a thin basement membrane in a flat line, no reedy ridges, no undulations. The corneal stroma seems like a rather bland, collagenous layer. Notice you don't even see any nuclei here. You really have to look for them. A few fibrocytic nuclei scattered through it. This blandness histologically in fact, is not really a valid representation of how dynamic and variable it is. The ground substance in the cornea changes in its character from area to area with different biochemical characteristics, different water binding capabilities. And sometimes we will use that knowledge uh, in pathogenesis because some types of corneal edema will specifically affect the surface or specifically affect the deep part of cornea, suggesting certain affinities for different kinds of ground substances. That's a, a theoretical issue that I'm not going to dwell upon very much. This has tight junctions, therefore it is a hydrophobic barrier. The cornea, it's the stroma itself is highly hydrophilic. Therefore, if there's a breach in the epithelium, guess what? The corneal stroma will suck up fluid like a sponge and therefore you have corneal edema. The corneal endothelium is a tattered, low cuboidal epithelium stretched along the inner surface of a very thick basement membrane called decimase membrane. In most of the, of the species we deal with, this corneal endothelium 
while, while metabolically very active, is not capable of mitosis in postnatal life. If you get into some of the rodents that will differ, this is a lab animal course, which of course now includes everything from horses downward. That's the problem with lab animals. So hard to know what species you're really going to be dealing with. Uh, so if you get into um, rats and mice, they retain some mitotic capability, but certainly everything from cats, dogs, and upward uh, in size do not have mitotic capability here. This is a very difficult layer to retain intact in section. Most often, you will find it floating around in tatters somewhere in the anterior chamber. Okay. The younger the animal, the easier it is to retain it in an intact form because the animal with a small, a young animal with a small eye, it's a nice, even a high cuboidal epithelium. As the eye grows, these cells simply stretch out to cover the greater corneal circumference. Decimase membrane is produced continuously throughout life, therefore it's thin in the young, thick in the old. It is capable of regeneration via secretion of basement membrane from the corneal endothelium. Well, what do you think of this? Little Boston Terrier, diffuse bilateral corneal opacity, that blue color, old blue eye, okay, corneal edema. What's the message? Strangle a dog, create corneal edema? Yeah. <laughs> Don't know. Haven't tried that a whole lot. Remember a few fox terriers in my time. I worked, before I went to vet school, I worked as a dog groomer. That's how I paid my way through school. And uh, I, I still to this day have a hatred for fox terriers. I cannot help myself. If you've ever worked at a kennel, fox terrier, they have this habit. They run around their cage, usually not on the floor. They're moving so fast, they run around the walls. And they defecate while they run. And then they play in it. They're disgusting little creatures. I, I'm, I'm very fond of dogs, but fox terriers, someone screwed up when they made fox terriers. That's all I can say. Anyhow, bilateral, bilateral corneal edema. When you think of corneal edema, what do you think about? You think first of epithelial damage, then you think of endothelial damage. The two barriers. The corneal epithelium, for the most part, is a passive hydrophobic barrier. It does have some active water exclusion uh, function, but it's mostly passive. The corneal endothelium, you'll recall, has an active ATPase pump to actually remove water. It also has its own tight junction, so it is a passive but mostly an active barrier. So when you have either epithelial or endothelial damage, that hydrophilic stroma is going to passively absorb water just like a sponge. In this case, it's bilateral and very extensive. The eye is not red or irritated looking at all. And in fact, this is a, this is a genetic inherited dystrophy in this dog. These dogs at middle age suddenly develop a, 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 a dysfunction in their corneal endothelium that results in passive osmotic imbibition of water by that corneal stroma. You end up with bilateral, permanent, irreparable, untreatable corneal edema. Corneal edema, okay. all you have really is a staining lucency. It can be a difficult histologic lesion to confirm. If you're lucky, it will be focal, and therefore this staining lucency will be in sharp contrast to the normal cornea on either side. When it is very diffuse and relatively subtle, it may be impossible to distinguish from the normal separation artifacts that occur between the corneal stromal lam lamellae. So hope for a focal lesion. In this case, clearly it is different superficially than it is deep, and there is no corneal epithelium over the top. Therefore, the pathogenesis of this edema is loss of epithelium, passive imbibition of water. Nice picture showing a thick basement membrane. This is from a boa constrictor. Uh, the, uh, not that that's relevant, except to point out that in most mammals, the epithelium, the uh, basement membrane is not nearly this thick. So that's a slight uh, abnormality here from what you would normally see. But the epithelium, very regular, maturing gradually, resting on a corneal stroma and a basement membrane. The adhesion here is hemidesmosomes to the basement membrane, and then anchoring filaments that project like little splayed anchors into the very superficial part of the corneal stroma. Corneal wound healing, almost every eye you will look at 
if it's part of a natural disease process rather than something that's a, that's a pharmaceutical uh, investigation, if it's, an, if it's an eye with real disease, uh, you will have corneal lesions, almost always. Whether it's ocular neoplasia, glaucoma, endophthalmitis, doesn't matter. You're going to have corneal disease. Rarely would an eye be enucleated because of the corneal disease, so it's an accompanying lesion. Nonetheless, it deserves our attention. The most familiar lesion is going to be epithelial ulceration. Its wound healing follows the pattern of wound healing anywhere else, with one important exception. The cornea, of course, has no blood vessels. Its clarity rests on that lack of, of cornification of the epithelium, the lack of pigment, the regularity of the stroma that doesn't interweave like normal collagen, but is highly regimented, and the lack of any blood vessels. So when you have a shallow defect, the epithelium will simply flatten and then slide and then undergo mitotic replication. Flattening and sliding in hours, mitotic replication in days. It heals very, very rapidly in an uncomplicated and friendly environment. You can heal a, a, a full thickness, uh, sorry, a full width corneal defect in less than 10 days. A one centimeter defect in a, in a horse, 10 days it's healed, two or three days for small erosions. So shallow defects in a, in a friendly environment, healing is no problem. Here the epithelium has stretched across the surface. Here there's a little bit of undulation and increased prominence of basement membrane, suggesting perhaps that this wasn't a simple healing. The epithelium here is a little jumbled and hyperplastic, a bit of frustration in wound healing but it's going to slide across the surface and then gradually rebuild itself. It'll take, however, several weeks for firm adhesion to develop. The sliding is rapid, the replication a little less rapid, but the reformation of the hemidesmosomes, and especially the anchoring filaments, is quite slow, so that there is the risk of recurrence of this erosion. And there's a syndrome in dogs we call, oddly enough, recurrent erosion syndrome, where the defect appears to be not in epithelial sliding or replication, but in the anchoring of that epithelium into the stroma. And I'll show you some pictures of that later. If you have a, an epithelial erosion, uncomplicated, heals quickly, no problem. Sort of first intention healing doesn't require vasculature or anything else. That epithelium will slide across. It's nourished by the tear film, mostly, so it doesn't require the vasculature to deliver its nutrients. No problem. Cornea heals, no trace, no scarring, nothing. If, however, the injury is persistent or that the injury is deeper than epithelial sliding can handle. And the rule of thumb is if the defect is deeper than 25% of the corneal stroma, if there's a big gouge out of that cornea, you're going to have to recruit vasculature to aid in that healing. You'll simply shift from epithelial sliding and replication into a granulation tissue pattern. But there's an interesting phenomenon here that I would call to your attention. Many of the diseases we see that affect the corneal epithelium are not just single one-shot traumas. They're chronic persistent irritation, as might occur, for example, in keratoconjunctivitis sicca, sialodacryo adenitis in rats. Okay. The lacrimal gland has been destroyed. There's no tear film. You have asked the cornea, normally bathed and nourished by tears, to exist in a dry and hostile environment. Keratoconjunctivitis sicca in dogs, dystochiasis with misdirected eyelashes. Pekingese dogs, where facial hair irritates the eye. Okay. What you've asked the epithelium to do is to exist in an unfriendly environment, and what it does is undergo squamous metaplasia. We call this phenomenon epidermalization, perhaps not the best name. But all it is is a skin-like metaplasia. The epithelium becomes pigmented, hyperplastic, develops reedy ridges, and pigmentation. And it sits upon a bed of vascularized connective tissue, skin and dermis, epidermis and dermis. That's what has happened. We have asked it to go back to its embryologic roots, so epidermalization. All this means is there's been chronic irritation. It is absolutely nonspecific. It could be a whole list of diseases, 
and your choice of what disease it is rests on species and environment and clinical findings. If we leave the epithelium for a moment, so its, its reactions are sliding, replication, reattachment. If it is a chronic situation where it is chronically irritated and unhappy, it will protect itself by this epithelial meta or this epidermal metaplasia that we call epidermalization. If we look at the stroma, it is not a passive bystander in the event of epithelial injury. If you have a defect, the first thing that's going to happen is corneal edema. If that passive barrier is lost, you'll get a patch of corneal edema. You will then have a passive imbibition, a passive infusion of tear film leukocytes into the superficial corneal stroma. That is inevitable. It doesn't mean sepsis. That's going to happen in every case. However, if those leukocytes then are given an added push, if it's septic, for example, or if the injury involves a lot of stromal or epithelial necrosis, where there's a lot of chemotactic factor for those leukocytes, and if they initiate or release a lot of growth factor, you are then going to change a simple ulcer that will heal by epithelial sliding into an ulcer that will require the participation of the full range of wound healing, namely granulation tissue. So you take this lesion and you change it into a huge bed of healing granulation fed by blood vessels radiating from the limbus. Remember, the corneal stroma has no blood vessels of its own. They exist out of the limbus at the conjunctival or scleral corneal junction. So the leukocytes, the injured epithelium, the injured stroma, all capable of producing fibroblast growth factor and uh, TGF beta, for example, a whole range of growth factors. They will begin to produce those and with a lag time of about four days, those factors which have been permeating laterally through the corneal stroma to the limbus will have activated the capillaries and the fibroblasts at the limbus to grow inward. That four days is a magic number. That's the lag time it takes to get the capillaries turned on to migrate. Four days ordinarily is plenty of time for a simple defect to heal across with epithelial sliding. So it's a nice check and balance system. If healing occurs in that four-day period, then the drive for granulation tissue will be shut off and you will not get the vascular ingrowth. Why is that so important? Because this is permanent. This is a blinding lesion. The eye places a high priority on seeing so that while this preserves the globe, it has a cost to it. And so the eye chooses not to use this unless absolutely necessary. What you will see histologically with a lesion like this is exactly what you'd see in any other tissue. Here is dead or at least extremely edema to stroma and here is a veil of granulation tissue. This is its moving edge. The limbus will be out here and it's moving inward with solid capillaries that will then form the, the uh, blood-filled lumens as they hollow out accompanied by fibroblasts and usually a bunch of leukocytes moving in one millimeter a day marching across this corneal stroma. That is permanent. You can treat this thing with corticosteroids till you die and you will never restore the corneal stroma to perfect normalcy. Epithelium on top, pigmented, thin, rather battered looking, and below it a huge mass of granulation tissue. There's some pigment that has come in from the limbus, blood vessels, leukocytes, fibroblasts. That's standard issue, chronic corneal ulceration that has healed with scarring. Nothing's, once, once you get the vessels in, it then behaves like any other tissue. This is the best that you can hope for. This is very chronic stage. This has been treated with steroids. The cornea has done its best to return to normal. The epithelium is more or less normal. If you want a couple of hints, it will usually retain a little bit of undulation and will have an abnormally thick basement membrane. Like any other healing epithelium, it heals with the aid of secretion of new basement membrane. Initially fibronectin, later a true basement membrane. So for every episode of ulceration, you'll have more basement membrane laid down. And in some of these dogs or cats or any other species that has chronic repeated ulcerations, you will have a very, very thick basement membrane as your best clue to that history of repeated ulceration. 
you will have in the stroma lamellar vascularization. It tends to run parallel to the corneal lamellae in these two locations. Okay, this happens to be a horse with periodic ophthalmia. It really doesn't matter what the species is. This is the best you can hope for. The ability of cornea to clear itself is highly species variable. Cows, for example, seem to do it very well. For those of you who come from large animal backgrounds, I mean, pink eye in cattle, where you have these iris, these corneal ruptures, and the iris is hanging it on the ground, getting kicked as the animal walks around. You say, my God, this eye is lost. That iris will amputate, that cornea will reform, it'll look like a terrible mess, and a year later, the cow can see again. It's remarkable. No other species I know of can do that. Dogs or cats, that eye would be lost in terms of vision. That's a really quick trip through corneal wound healing. If, I hate to sort of be pragmatic and say, if you get an eye on the board exams or something, what to do with it. Okay. Look for epithelial regularity. No pigment, no keratinization. Look for an inconspicuous basal lamina. If you get any undulation at all and any thickening of that basement membrane, if you can see the basement membrane, it's probably too thick. And that suggests previous ulceration. Look to the stroma. No blood vessels. If there are any blood vessels, you've had some kind of a chronic corneal injury. In clinical practice, you also see lots of these strange looking things. Ring-like deposits, it varies with the specific disease involved. If you look at these histologically, these might be deposits of, of calcium, other minerals, or lipid in the form of cholesterol clefts within the corneal stroma. This crosses species boundaries. These are inherited, well, sometimes at least, inherited defects in corneal stromal biochemistry, primary corneal stromal dystrophies. It can also be seen as a non-inherited, non-genetic defect in animals with hyperlipemia, for example, hypercholesterolemia of any cause. You can experimentally induce this. And this will be a ring of cholesterol crystals. If you look histologically, there might be some macrophage reaction to it. In other cases, there is virtually nothing, just cholesterol clefts. But there's a whole range, depending on the species you're dealing with, of inherited stromal dystrophies all with specific ages of onset and clinical outcomes. This is recurrent erosion syndrome in dogs, a rather fascinating disease. And those of you who have been in clinical practice doing small animals would be familiar with these. These are ulcers that just will not heal, these flaps that don't adhere very well. And you see it occasionally in other species. I've seen it in horses and in cats, the occasional specimen coming in. What you have is absolutely normal epithelial wound healing. The corneal epithelium is normal. It slides across. It then thickens and undergoes mitotic replication, but it won't adhere. It'll adhere for a little while and then come off again. And the defect appears to be in the superficial stroma. The superficial stroma often looks dead and has karyorectic nuclei in it. We know that the basement membrane is normal. We know the hemidesmosomes are normal. That's been studied. No one has really studied the superficial stroma. And my belief is, not proven, what happens is the anchoring filaments that anchor the, the hemidesmosomes really into the stroma have nothing to hang on to. The epithelium is normal, but there's nothing to grab. I'm trying to anchor into quicksand. And there's some support for that. This is, a, uh, this is one of my favorite slides. And you say, well, this guy's got to be crazy. That doesn't look like a very interesting thing at all. The new, the new uh, what's in vogue right now for dealing with recurrent erosions, this is very clinical stuff. It's called cross-hatching. A bored surgeon playing tic-tac-toe on the cornea. They take a needle or a, the back edge of a scalpel blade and make shallow cross-hatches across the cornea, 20 or 30 of them and then these erosions heal. Well, what's that doing? In the old days, we used you know, silver nitrate and phenol and all kinds of terrible things, pouring it on these corneas, trying to scarify them. What does cross-hatching do? How does it work? What it does, this is a cross-hatch. If the cross-hatching is deep enough, what it does, it provides a channel from the deep stroma up to the epithelium. And through this channel grows a bed of granulation tissue that then spreads out across the surface of cornea. 
Here is dead stroma that will not receive the anchoring filaments, but now we've bypassed that with a channel and then a layer of granulation, and this is what the cornea can now stick down to. And that's the strategy used for, this striate, for these, these uh, uh, punctate keratotomies or striate keratotomies, the cross hatchings. I can see you're totally enthused by that. Well, sorry, what can I say? I thought this was a great slide. Show this to a bunch of clinical ophthalmologists last month. I mean, you know, they all collapsed in their seats in awe, but uh, what, can I, what can I say? It's a great slide. Take my word for it. Okay. Another view of it. Okay, this is again a chronic corneal disease. There has been vascularization here attempting to heal the epithelial defect. That epithelium keeps generating growth factors. The cornea has responded as best it can, but it, it, it just can't do anything with this dead superficial stroma until we give it some help by creating this channel through it and allowing that granulation to spread out. I think that's just fantastic. Histopathology providing the clinicians with an insight. Of course, we do that every day. They simply refuse to accept it, right? But here we have it. Another specific corneal dis disease, just to grapple with, unique to cats, cats of any size. You can see it in lions and tigers at zoos, too. This is corneal sequestration or, co or corneal sequestrum. It is a, in this case, it's f it, it, is, it has caused a reaction. It's now being fed by a large blood vessel. But often, all you will see will be a, a dark orange to brown to eventually black spot in the middle of the cornea. And that's all, no reaction to it whatsoever. Absolutely remarkable. And histologically, this is incredibly boring. These things are cut out by doing keratectomies. And sometimes they have to be grafted, but sometimes they'll just heal naturally and the cats will do fine. A few of them will recur. And all you have is normal stroma, a big area of pale staining, dead stroma that has this orange pigmentation. We do not know anything about the pathogenesis of this disease. It is unique to cats. We have not been able to reproduce it. And amazingly, no one even knows what the pigment is. It is widely assumed to be a porphyrin breakdown product from the tear film, and therefore a secondary effect. In other words, the assumption is this is a disease of stromal and epithelial necrosis, and the pigmentation is simply imbibed into that from the tear film, and thus the animal goes brown. No proof of that. And some clinicians absolutely swear that the pigmentation precedes ulceration, in which case it clearly cannot be tear film, because an intact epithelium wouldn't would let it in there. So these things are usually surgically excised. They will eventually self-expel over a period of months and heal with huge granulation scar. Uh, Persian cats and Himalayans, which are Persian crosses really, is, uh, are, are breeds that are predisposed. So remarkable. I'm always appalled you know, by these quagmires of ignorance in veterinary medicine. Here we are doing all this molecular biology and wonderful stuff, and yet common diseases like this we know absolutely nothing about because it occurs only in cats. And who's going to fund the research to investigate it? Right, cat breeders of America, $1.99 plus tax, do what you can, doc, you know, so. I'm, I mean, if there are any questions, please interrupt. I'm, I'm trying to give you a bit of a, a sense about eyes, but I'm appalled at myself for leaving behind so many important, uh, important points. This is another cat, doesn't matter. Could be rat, could be mouse, could be leopard. It wouldn't matter. Could be elephant, except I'd be taking a picture from a little further away. Uh, bilateral uh, exudate within the anterior chamber of these eyes. Uveitis, one of, the, one of the reasons for which you will get a nucleated eyes or necropsies with eyes brought to your attention. Animal has red eyes with junk in them. Not a perfect section. Lenses get very hard and shatter. But what do we, what do we have here? What are some, some of the lesions? We have to list them. Retinal separation with a subretinal exudate or retinal detachment. Certainly a diffuse thickening of the choroid. This is much thicker than it should be, suggesting a diffuse choroidal infiltrate. That is likely the pathogenesis of the retinal detachment as the inflammatory disease in choroid, like inflammation anywhere else, is going to leak fluid. 
I mean, this, all of this really is, is pleural or peritoneal fluid happening to enter a potential space, not the pleural cavity or the peritoneal cavity, but the subretinal space. Remember, embryologically, the retina lies against the retinal pigment epithelium, but there's no actual attachment there. So any fluid effusion coming out of an inflamed uveal tract, I can just imagine this fluid molecule saying, well, let's see, I can go in two directions. I can either go through this dense collagenous sclera, which is a hard road to hoe, or I can simply percolate out into this nice, friendly subretinal space. So the fluid always goes that way. Not stupid. Okay, so there we are, subretinal fluid, retinal detachment. The retina will therefore degenerate because it's been removed from its nourishing retinal pigment epithelium and the vasculature of the choroid. There's fluid in the anterior chamber. We call this a plasmoid aqueous because it's rich in plasma. The normal aqueous, very low in serum protein. Therefore, when you put an eye that has increased protein in an acidic fixative like, uh, like Zenkers or Bruins, it will coagulate, so we call it plasmoid. The clinician will call this an aqueous flare as that protein alters the path of light, the Tyndall effect. And that's really all we can say about this. There is certainly a, a massive posterior segment inflammation, so we call this a choroiditis, choroidal effusion, and a serous retinal detachment. What is this? It could be anything. It could be anything. The uveal tract is an integrated vascular network. What affects the iris affects the choroid. This could be systemic mycosis, systemic neoplasia, hypertension, all kinds of things. Anything capable of inducing a change in vascular permeability. Most of the time, it's going to be part of systemic disease, but not necessarily. This is probably too small to read from the back of, of, of the room. I don't know that we need again to review this with anterior chamber, and posterior chamber, ciliary body with its processes. Ciliary body is divided into two units. The, there's the pars placata, which is where the processes are, and the pars plana, which is flat, which is what pars plana means if you're a Latin scholar. And then it will join the retina at an area that in people is called aura serrata because it's serrated, but in animals it's simply called aura ciliaris retinae, or junction between ciliary body and retina. Optic papilla, really not much of an issue in most animals. We just call it optic disc to the optic nerve. I mean, this is all, I'm sure, very, very familiar to you. This is taken from the anterior segment of a horse. A couple of things worth noting. Here's the cornea coming across. This is the limbus. In many species, it's marked by a line of pigment right through here. And let's remember that because it's going to be the site of origin for a very interesting neoplasm that we see in dogs and occasionally in cats, called, oddly enough, a limbic melanoma. It's going to arise right in there in this line of pigment. But this is the, this is the iris, this iris stroma. This is the iris epithelium which embryologically is, in, is identical to retina and retinal pigment epithelium. And it will undergo some of the same degenerative changes. Embryologically, in some anomaly, it is possible to actually have this developing into retina as its differentiation messages get a little bit uh, confused. The ciliary process is developed by plication of this posterior iris epithelium. So they are a later development embryologically and evolutionarily than is the iris epithelium itself. As you change species in the, let's, I'll insult them for a moment, call them lower species, although I'm not really hung up on phylogenetic hierarchies, but if you look at a chinchilla or a, uh, uh, or a mouse or a rat, you will find the ciliary processes coming off the back of the iris. If you look at a dog or a cat, you will find the ciliary processes mostly back here, that the iris will remain smooth to that point. If you look at a fish, you will not see any ciliary processes at all. So ciliary processes embryologically are a late development, and in terms of evolution, they appear to be a late development. Fish make their aqueous humor from the iris epithelium at the back of the root of the iris, right in here, which is exactly where our rodents begin to develop ciliary processes. Aqueous humor is a, a combination of ultrafiltration and secretion by the ciliary epithelium. 
Lens onules are also secreted here by ciliary epithelium. They anchor to the ciliary processes, particularly in the valleys between the ciliary processes and to the pars plana, and they sweep forward to anchor at the lens equator. You can see them in histologic section, especially in inflammatory disease where they tend to get thickened with some protein globbing onto the surface. You'll see the zonules, so it's kind of neat to see those. Filtration angle, a great uh, mystery to most people and the cause of great grief because at least half the eyes I get sent into me from all over North America have glaucoma. So I spend half my life, it seems, looking at filtration angles, trying to make out what's going on. The iris stroma, by the way, is, is, is of the same embryologic derivation as the corneal stroma, as the uveal tract, and the sclera. In the developing eye, we talked about that hollow sphere, the ocular vesicle, then the optic cup. But outside of that is that great mass of undifferentiated mesenchyme. And it sends wave after wave into that eye. Wave number one to form the corneal stroma, then the corneal endothelium, then the iris stroma. All of these waves marching in, very regimented. Great opportunity for embryologic screw-ups. The wrong wave at the wrong time in the wrong place. And some anomalies, you just have to sit there and marvel at, at the iris forming, for example, in the middle of the cornea. It does happen. You'll actually see things like that where, oops, the wave of mesenchyme destined to form iris stroma ends up in the wrong location. The ciliary, or the uh, trabecular meshwork, or ciliary cleft or filtration angle, and we'll differentiate those in a minute, forms as a postnatal or late prenatal rarefaction of a solid mesenchymal mass. It starts life like iris stroma and then develops holes in it to allow for the egress of aqueous. Quite commonly, that rarefaction process is interrupted or it's faulty and you end up with developmental anomalies leading to glaucoma. In dogs, that is the major cause of glaucoma, malformation of the filtration angle. I'm not sure this is highly relevant, but let me just try something on you. When you're looking at an eye with a raging uveitis or endophthalmitis, you're often very disappointed that the tissue itself contains relatively few cells. The anterior chamber is loaded with fibrin and neutrophils, but there's hardly a leukocyte to be found within the iris. The iris is where the inflammation is happening, so why aren't the cells there? The iris surface has no continuous layer of epithelium. This is just a great big sponge. There are tight junctions back here between the two layers of the iris epithelium, but there's nothing up front. When you have inflammation in the iris, it is like anywhere else, perivascular accumulations of leukocytes, but chemotaxis quickly leads them out into the aqueous. They do not dally within the iris stroma. So in most acute uveitises, granulocytic uveitises, neutrophilic, eosinophilic, you will not find many cells in the iris at all. They accumulate out here in the anterior chamber. This is a constrictor muscle of iris, in case you were wondering. The iris stroma, uh, mesenchymal origin, filled with melanocytes, blood vessels, and fibroblasts. Okay, this thin layer right here is the dilator muscle. So the large muscle fibers are the constrictor fibers, and they exist only in this pupillary third of the iris. They will disappear right about at this level. But the dilator muscle is continuous all the way along. And it is a muscle derived from the neuroepithelium. So it is a cell process coming off the anterior most layer of the iris epithelium. Neurectoderm making muscle, kind of a neat trick. Just digress, just to keep your interest up, if that's possible. Um, a fish has this great big lens sitting in the pupil, where it's a good place for a lens to be, uh, but it's, it, its shape cannot be altered. We focus, right? Mammals, higher mammals especially, focus by changing the shape of their lens. That's what the ciliary muscle does, putting tension on the zonules or releasing tension from the zonules. A fish can't do that. Its lens. Its lens is, is huge, but cannot change shape. What the fish has is something called a retractor lentis muscle. It's like a telephoto lens on a camera. It's got a muscle that goes from the back of the lens back to the retina, and it moves this lens back and forth by the retractor lentis muscle. 
What a wonderful focusing mechanism. Zoom, 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 zoom. That muscle is derived also from the retina. So in mammals, we've chosen to put our neuroepithelial, neuroectodermal muscle in the iris. Fish has it crossing the vitreous, suspending this lens, moving it like a pendulum back and forth, in and out. Ciliary processes. Double layer of epithelium. This is a PAS stain. It's, that's actually an alcium blue PAS, but you can see the basement membrane. What's the basement membrane doing facing the posterior chamber? Well, embryologically, remember, this eye has caved in upon itself. And as far as this cell is concerned, this really is the cell base. You have to go back to that image of a vesicle becoming a cup by having its face pushed right into itself. So in fact, these two layers are oriented apex to apex. This is the apex of the non-pigmented epithelium butting against the apex of the pigmented epithelium. These are the ciliary process. This is the ciliary stroma here. Again, just as you can see it, folding off the back of the iris. In inflammation, if you're wondering, does this eye have any inflammation at all, look to the ciliary processes. It's the most sensitive indicator because in the iris, once you get inflammation and you begin to get your vessels leaking, it'll simply diffuse out into the anterior chamber. You won't be able to see any accumulation of edema fluid. But in the ciliary processes, the vessels are leaky, they're fenestrated, and the tight junctions are between the epithelial cells so that they will block the egress of fluid that wants to leak out of modestly inflamed vessels. So in early mild inflammation, you get cystic distension of ciliary processes. You've heard of the blood-brain barrier. Well, the eye has the blood-eye barrier. Very important for the eye's continued health that it does not mingle with systemic circulation very freely, just like brain. So the blood-eye barrier up in this anterior part of the eye rests in the tight junctions between the iris endothelial cells because it has no epithelium. But here, the barrier is in the epithelium itself. So look for cystic distension of ciliary processes as a very early indicator of inflammation. Let's deal for a very quick moment with another differentiation of the anterior uvea, namely the trabecular meshwork. Again, in most, in most species, this is a postnatal. It depends. If you're talking about cows, horses, guinea pigs that are born precocious and ready to go, this will be fully formed. But if you're talking about most species in which the young are born sort of helpless and naked, uh, then this starts life as a solid mesenchymal mass looking just like iris. And over a period in a dog, for example, of about three weeks, it develops these tracts and holes in it, this process of rarefaction. The aqueous humor secreted here at ciliary epithelium, past lens through pupil, meets the first barrier. This is called the pectinate ligament. It is a perforated spider web-like membrane that separates the anterior chamber from the trabecular meshwork. This structure is called the ciliary cleft or filtration angle, generic term for the whole structure. This is called the trabecular meshwork. It has two parts. It has the uveal trabecular meshwork, which basically moves backwards into ciliary body. And it has what's called the corneal scleral trabecular meshwork, which is oriented to act as a filter, if you will, for fluid moving out into the sclera. So the corneal scleral meshwork and the uveal meshwork, which is more interior and perhaps slightly caudal to the corneal scleral. The fluid will then traverse this area through this series of sieves and then end up, not shown in this picture, but some large veins, the scleral venous plexus. We're going to spend a little bit of time looking at this area when we talk about glaucoma. But I guess what's, what's of some importance, this is an unusual picture in that it has captured a trabecular or a, a pectinate ligament intact. This doesn't occur in primates, by the way. Pectinate ligament, the whole structure is very different in primates. Man is a bad model for animal eye disease. I don't use them myself. So I take too much food and complain a lot about the conditions. Um, 
So ordinarily, this is a very delicate meshwork that is not easily captured in section. When you see one intact like this, in fact, you even begin to think about anomalous thickening, that it's so abnormal to catch one in complete section. But nonetheless, it, this picture happens to show it very well. If we move to the back of the eye, just to continue sort of an anatomic review of the uvea. Okay. We're talking then about the posterior segment of the eye. And this is where people really go nuts. They're not, once you get into uvea, it's just vascular tissue. If you know lamina propria of gut, you can do uveal pathology. It does exactly the same things. Gets inflamed, undergoes fibrosis, does all the same things, no problem. Let's just do our anatomy again. Here's the retina with its, uh, with its nine layers or so. Photoreceptors, outermost. It's gonna be hard to see from the back, but it's a difficult tissue to photograph in an overall anatomic view. This simple cuboidal epithelium right here. This is the retinal pigment epithelium. Funny name, retinal pigment epithelium, but it's got no pigment in it. Well, this would be a bad design because here we're dorsal to the optic disc. And this structure is the tapetum. This is what tapetum looks like histologically. It would not make sense to have a reflective mirror, presumably designed to increase the light sensitivity of retina by reflecting light back to give it a second shot at the photoreceptors, and then cover that mirror with black spray paint. So dorsal to the optic disc, the retinal pigment epithelium loses its pigment. So in a sort of an idiot's view of an eyeball, if you're trying to describe if we move to the back of the eye, just to continue sort of an anatomic review of the uvea. Okay. We're talking then about the posterior segment of the eye. And this is where people really go nuts. They're not, once you get into uvea, it's just vascular tissue. If you know lamina propria of gut, you can do uveal pathology. It does exactly the same things. Gets inflamed, undergoes fibrosis, does all the same things, no problem. Let's just do our anatomy again. Here's the retina with its, uh, with its nine layers or so, photoreceptors outermost. It's gonna be hard to see from the back, but it's a difficult tissue to photograph in an overall anatomic view. This simple cuboidal epithelium right here. This is the retinal pigment epithelium. Funny name, retinal pigment epithelium, but it's got no pigment in it. Well, this would be a bad design because here we're dorsal to the optic disc and this structure is the tapetum. This is what tapetum looks like histologically. It would not make sense to have a reflective mirror, presumably designed to increase the light sensitivity of retina by reflecting light back to give it a second shot at the photoreceptors, and then cover that mirror with black spray paint. So dorsal to the optic disc, the retinal pigment epithelium loses its pigment. So in a sort of an idiot's view of an eyeball, if you're trying to describe it, and am I dorsal or ventral to the optic nerve for descriptive purposes, just look at the RPE. If it has pigment, you're ventral. If it doesn't have pigment, you're dorsal. Because in some animals, it's very difficult to see the tapetum. If you're in an albino, of course, you're out of luck. Can't use that. Okay, so this, any species that has a tapetum, this is what it will look like. This is the choroid. The choroid rich in vasculature, rich in pigment. Here's a vessel running from here across your tapetum. Well, where's it going? Inconspicuous, even more so than the RPE, is a very thin vascular tunic lying between RPE and tapetum. And that's called the choriocapillaris. It is inconspicuous in ordinary histologic preparations. But it's incredibly important because it is the choriocapillaris that acts as the nutritional bed which via diffusion feeds the outer half of this retina. If you have a vascular disease, anything from DIC to sclerosis to hypertension to tumor embolus affecting the choroid, you will impair the transfer of blood to the choriocapillaris and thus to the retina and you will watch the outer half of your retina die. The inner half of the retina will remain alive, supplied by its own intrinsic retinal vasculature. So the, the outer half will die, the inner half will live. If we want to just, again, I don't want to, 
to bore you. Some of you are probably experts at eye pathology and others don't know anything about eyes, so I'm going to tread the middle ground. Just really quickly review the layers. Would that be reasonable? Yes? No? Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. And I'm even going to mention all of them because they're irrelevant. Let's talk about a few of the important ones. This is the nerve fiber layer. These are the axons of the ganglion cells. These big cells, looking like Purkinje cells, are the ganglion cells. These other little guys are all astrocytes. Forget them. These are the ganglion cells. Their number varies a lot among the species. Rule of thumb in a dog or cat is one ganglion cell per 40x field as you're moving across the retina. They are always more numerous near the optic disc than they are peripherally. Why is that even of some use? Because ganglion cell loss is the major lesion that you will use to diagnose glaucoma. So you have to get used to how many ganglion cells you're supposed to see. So the ganglion cell sending out its axon to create the nerve fiber layer which moves along and then exits via the optic nerve. They form the optic nerve. Therefore, if you have a disease that affects your ganglion cells, it will inevitably affect their axons, and what you'll end up with is loss of optic nerve. That's all there is to the optic nerve. Conversely, if you have something that severs the optic nerve, gunshot wound, <coughs> car accident where the eye moves forward as the rest of the body stops, and you get boing, boing, out it goes, wrecks the optic nerve, you will get a dieback to the level of the ganglion cell. So nerve fiber layer, ganglion cell layer, inner plexiform, inner nuclear, outer plexiform, outer nuclear, and photoreceptors. Okay. Nerve fiber layer, ganglion cell layer. Nerve fiber layers, axons of the ganglion cells. This inner plexiform layer is simply a mixture of the dendrites of the ganglion cells plus the axons of this inner nuclear layer. The outer plexiform layer, again, is just a mixture of axons and dendrites derived from the two nuclear layers. The plexiform layers will disappear if you have a lot of cell loss within these ganglion cell layers. Sometimes that's very useful. I have great difficulty looking at early retinal atrophies where I have, let us say, a 30% diminution in the number of outer nuclear layer cells. I find that difficult to assess. I have a terrible time trying to assess do I have 30% fewer photoreceptors. I don't think I can do that accurately. But what I can probably assess is that the inner and outer nuclear layers begin to blend because a 30% loss in the plexiform layer, which would be inevitable if you've lost 30% of the cells that contribute to it, you begin to see blending of the inner and outer nuclear layers. So it's kind of useful to know that if you're trying to assess is there in fact a diminution in the ganglion cell layer. It's particularly difficult when you change species and you're not familiar. How many ganglion cells does an, or how many, sorry, how many uh, neurons does an alligator have? Answer, many more than a horse, but anyhow. I, I had an alligator eye sent to me. What would you imagine an alligator eye would have? Lots of ganglion cells and photoreceptors or few? Do they see re really well? I mean, I come from Canada. What do I know about alligators, right? Nothing, okay? Yeah, they see really well. I got this eye and I looked at it and I said, oh, I expect to see this kind of you know, mud, mud dwelling lower life form with a few ganglion cells, not many photoreceptors because they kind of lurk around in all this muddy water. Any of you that know alligators know that isn't so. They sit on the surface, see a toy poodle, uh, see a fox terrier playing on the, <laughs> playing on the shore and say, oh, yum, you know, egg McMuffin coming up, right? In fact, they hunt. when I looked at this alligator eye, knowing nothing about alligators, I saw an eye, a, a retina more sophisticated than this dog, more ganglion cells, and a, a closer relationship numerically between photoreceptors and the ganglion cell. That's called summation. The closer these are to one to one, like in that archer fish, the more point discrimination one has. If you have a lot of photoreceptors, converging on a single ganglion cell, this is a night adapted animal gathering a lot of light in, struggling to fire a single ganglion cell to make at least a hazy image. If you have an animal that needs really sharp point discrimination, the lowly chicken walking through the barnyard 
Seed, gravel, seed, gravel. Let's eat seed, leave the gravel. Peck, 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 they don't miss. Okay? They have excellent point discrimination. A chicken has an, an extremely highly evolved retina with many more ganglion cells than this so that they have better point to point discrimination. Anyhow, a small, a small thing. Anyhow, so we've got our retinal layers, we've got the photoreceptors in most of the animals we deal with, mostly rods, relatively few cones, so they're equipped for night and motion vision. That varies with the species. Um, and then these photoreceptors anchor lock and key fashion into surface indentations in the RPE. The RPE embryologically, this orchestrator of development, but in the postnatal life, their main job is to nourish the photoreceptors, providing nutrition, acting as phagocytes to remove the effete, I love effete as a word, it has a sort of a, a sleazy ring to it, effete photoreceptors. Okay, the photoreceptors, as you know, like intestinal villi, are constantly turning over, shedding, but they have no place to go, so the RPE cells gobble it up and re remove it. So providing nutrition, removing waste, that's their job. One hates to say that anything in this life is wasted, but in terms of the kind of pathology that I deal with, no. Uh, there's no question that if you're talking about some, um, some experimental drug work and so on, we enter ultrastructural pathology, yes, there's all kinds of stuff. But the limiting membranes in general are not a light microscopic feature, and to my knowledge, in naturally occurring disease, they're not an issue. I, I, I mean, I may be corrected on that, but there's not a disease I know of where I'm saying to myself, I gotta really look at one of those outer or inner or Brooks membrane. Physiologically, they're important, but not in terms of, of light microscopic pathology. Bruin's fixed eye, lovely section. This is the easiest kind of eye in the world to make a good section of. Because if you put an eye that has lots of inflammation, which has plasma replacing its vitreous and aqueous, you put it into an acidic fixative, you're going to coagulate that fixative, sorry, co coagulate that plasmoid aqueous and vitreous. It's like the, the difference is between trimming a raw egg and a hard boiled egg. These eyes become nice and firm and trimming them is like cutting a piece of liver. They're nice and firm. So you just slice right through the middle, right through the optic nerve. I lay them with the cornea side down on a wax block, place my blade next to the optic nerve and I just slice right through it, a long samurai sword slice, not a chopping, hacking, sawing motion. Long blade, single slice, and I'm through it. And that's the picture that, that you have. Let's have a little quiz here. What's wrong with this eye? Let me, give me some lesions. Yeah. Before I yep. take a second slice after that? Or yes. I, I, that's the hard one. Yeah. Okay, there's a, okay. You want, it, you want a sneaky trick? Use thick cassettes, okay? Never go through the lens on the second slice. That's where you have your problem. Take this eye that you've sliced, right? You've sliced just beside the optic nerve. Don't go through it, go beside it. If you go right through it, by the time your histotechnician gets the wax block moving properly, you've lost your optic nerve. So cut beside the optic nerve, right through to the front of the eye, chop through that lens, right? guillotine right through the lens and through the cornea. Then the eye flops over, this is what you've got. Take this eye, lay it with this cut face down on the wax block, take your knife and then take a slice off that uncut half of the eye, shallow enough that you miss the lens. Don't go in very deeply. You'll be left in a dog, for example, with about a one centimeter thick slice. In a horse, you'll be left with a two centimeter thick slice. But all you need to do is get thicker cassettes. Even retrieve some of those old metal cassettes that we all grew to hate in the 60s, you know? Or just use uh, tissue bags. Okay, they can go through Technicon processing, so use tissue bags. Don't try to get them into those three millimeter cassettes. There's no problem, you see, because eyes are hollow. It's not like you've cut a three uh, a, a centimeter thick slice of muscle that the xylene and paraffin will never get through. They can, they can do this. So just keep a thick slice, avoid the lens and your problems will be over. How do you handle tiny eyes, 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 
some people actually embed them whole. Uh, the problem is getting air bubbles in them or getting the air bubbles out, out of them. I do them much the same way if they're really small, like if they're juvenile and don't have a lot of calcium, I'll do the whole head. I'll just simply cut across the head, leaving the eyes in place and let them then do serial slices of the whole head. It's amazing if you look at fish and birds that way, you discover the eye, of course, is immensely bigger than the brain. And that's not a joke, it's really true. I have, I have several pictures of this tiny little, the whole head, tiny little brain, great big eyes. Phylogenetically, the eyes drove the evolution of the nervous system. If you look at lower species, their eyes are much bigger and yet highly evolved. Fish eyes are much more sophisticated than ours. You take most predaceous fish, they see better than we do. Never try to sneak up on a fish. <laughs> I could get into my fishing stories, but you know, I, I mean, if you try to fish for an archer fish, you know, you're casting, you know, you've got a little red devil. I can just see the fish in there now. Oh, look, there's a red devil. It's got the Kmart price tag on it. He's a thousand yards away. You think you're fooling this fish? You've got to be crazy, you know? He knows exactly what that is. Uh, then why does he bite? This is the question. Well, it's because he's got great eyes, but no brain. This is the problem. <laughs> Small, small, small eyes, quite honestly, I do all my eyes, I try to do them in exactly the same way until I get, I don't do many mice, but I do like canaries and so on, their eyes aren't very big. I try to at least take one slice off them. Mary, you have some insights? I didn't want to confuse the issue, but yes, I take... Thank you, I'll mention that now. The second slice that I take, so the first slice I move from the optic nerve forward with the cornea down on the wax block and I chop through that lens and at the same time, that same chop will take me through the cornea. My second slice, I, I like to move, instead of from the back forward, I like to go from cornea backward. Why would I do that? To try and avoid detaching the retina. So my second slice, I'll move in the opposite direction. It's not a religious experience. If the eye is well fixed, you can probably do it either way. Incidentally, I also instruct the histotechnicians to move their microtome blade from cornea back, not from retina forward. So when they place the eye in the block, I suggest that to them because they will, they, that can also avoid detaching retina, even in the wax block. You can put enough tension on to detach it. I have yet to conquer horse eyes. I cannot fix a horse eye that I don't detach the retina. Okay, lesions in this eye. You thought I was going to be sidetracked, didn't you? But not so. Okay, easy lesions, eh? Detached retina. Obviously, increased protein in all ocular chambers. So there's got to be inflammatory disease, alteration in blood eye barrier, increased vascular permeability. So a serious retinal detachment. Clinicians call this a morning glory detachment because looking into the eye, this looks like you're looking down the funnel of a morning glory because you see the retina bowing up at you, just like a, a flower. So complete retinal detachment. What else? Don't be bashful. Come on. Posterior synechia. Posterior synechia. So I hate special ophthalmic words, but that's what it's called, right? It's an, it's an iridolenticular adhesion. So posterior synechia, right here. As a result, pupillary obstruction. What do you call this phenomenon going on in iris here? Iris Bombay. Iris Bombay is never a primary lesion. Iris Boeing. See, ophthalmologists are so sneaky. They not only use Latin and Greek, they even reach into French. How clever of them, okay? Iris Bombay, Bombay door, Bombay window. Okay, it is the result of a complete posterior sneak hit. You'll only get Iris Bombay if you have something approaching a 360 degree pupillary block where the continued production of aqueous causes the iris to bow forward. As it does that, it inevitably produces the second lesion, which is peripheral anterior synechia, or an iridocorneal adhesion. So this is like the litany. This is the whole hum diagnosis because it's so frequent. Chronic inflammatory disease, iris exuding plasma fibrin leukocytes. Iris is sticky. Normal iris sits against lens. Oops, bad plan. Iris sticks to lens. With a couple of days time, that adhesion becomes firm enough that it actually adheres there by a collagenous bridge, not just fibrin, 
uh, it may then obstruct the passage of aqueous iris bombay peripheral anterior synechia enucleation. This, by the way, also has a lens that is anterior posteriorly flattened, and that suggests loss of lens substance. And this looks like plasma within the lens, and this animal has a lens perforation. But we'll get into that later. So retinal plasmoid aqueous, plasmoid vitreous, subretinal serous fluid, complete retinal detachment, posterior, circumferential posterior synechia, with iris bombay, peripheral anterior synechia, loss of lens substance, and a suggestion of some kind of intralenticular plasmoid material. This is blastomycosis. It could be anything. This could be lymphoma. This could be hypertension. This could be uh, uh, any of the systemic mycoses, uh, cholebacillosis in a calf. It doesn't matter. No point dealing with those specific diseases because each species has their own. This happens to be cryptococcosis, but big deal. The typical kind of non-inflammatory, inflammatory disease, if you will. Lots of organisms, very little inflammation. Here it is in a choroid. Here it is in the subretinal space. So outer nuclear layer, photoreceptors, and here they are growing in the subretinal space. I mean. All you have to, the, the, dealing with uveitis is a matter of looking for the agent playing the odds, looking at systemic disease in the animal. Not a great picture, but I don't live in the right climate for this one. Any ideas? Big, big hint, you know, large spherical body containing small spherical bodies. <laughs> Terribly destructive disease, lots of nuclear debris, lots of fibrin. This used to be a ciliary body, it's now not. It's just a big mass of garbage. Coccidioidomycosis, who cares, right? I've got, everyone got that nice orange book, what is it, Kaplan and Aiello, is that the name of it? You know, the nice orange uh, mycosis book. I match pictures, that's what I do. You know, I get it out and hope they're in color and just match pictures. I mean, I'm not embarrassed. I, I, I must take a little aside here. And I mean, I feel really funny standing here, especially for the people here who are going to write the boards. See, because of my, I'm not a real enthusiast for the boards. Um, those of you who are studying for them are clearly not either, but I mean, one, one recognizes the intellectual challenge and, and the intent of the boards, and I accept that fully. What I don't accept is that in my life, I do not need to make my diagnoses in eight minutes or 12 minutes. Um, and and uh, I mean, I shop the corridors, I ask opinions, I read books. In the end, what counts is recognizing when you need help and knowing where to find it. You know, I mean, it, as I tell my students that I teach in second and third year veterinary school, it doesn't matter how quickly you learn to ride the bicycle, it's how well you do it in the end that counts. And this is my problem. We've allowed the need for legally defensible exams that withstand lawsuit challenges to create an exam that to me is just not measuring what I would choose to measure in my students. That's my gospel for the day. Um, I will not get paid now for coming here. <laughs> Let me spend a couple of minutes talking about a really important general concept, and, and I don't know quite how I'm going to do this, but the acute uveitis. First of all, let's get some terminology straight. Uveitis, anterior uveitis, endophthalmitis, panophthalmitis, what a mess, eh? Okay. Uveitis is obviously inflammation of the uveal tract. It's the generic term. Anterior means iridocyclitis, iris and ciliary body. So iridocyclitis equals anterior uveitis. You can use them interchangeably. Clinicians will distinguish anterior uveitis from posterior uveitis. Posterior uveitis equals choroiditis because the diseases that cause one are slightly different than those that cause the other. Nonetheless, histologically, 
we are dealing with an integrated vascular bed. And I will suggest to you that all eyes that have uveitis, be it anterior or posterior, clinically, are diffuse histologically. The clinician is using less sensitive tools to detect it. So he or she is impressed by an anterior or posterior appearance. But for us histologically, it's very unusual to see a raging iridocyclitis that does not also have choroiditis, or a choroiditis that does not also have an anterior uveitis. Endophthalmitis technically means a uveitis which also involves inflammation of the ocular cavities. So in other words, a vitriol inflammation and an anterior or a, an aqueous humor inflammation. Now you tell me what kind of uveitis is not going to involve exudation into the chambers? None. So that in fact, that clinical name, endophthalmitis versus uveitis, has very little meaning. Have I confused you totally? Probably. Okay. So clinicians have a series of nomenclatures that are useful to them because they correlate with specific diseases. When it comes to histology with a more sensitive tool for measuring it, when you get uveal inflammation, you will almost always have outpouring of that exudate into the ocular chambers. So I use endophthalmitis a great deal when I'm dealing with any kind of uveal disease because technically, unless you're in the very early stages, you almost always have some exudation when you're talking about, about the exudative phase of disease. The only time I will not use endophthalmitis is when I'm dealing with chronic disease, which is lymphocytic plasmacytic and therefore not exudative. So there is no involvement of the ocular chambers. And then it's proper to just use, in this case, if this were the only site of lesion, this would be an iridocyclitis or an anterior uveitis. What is the etiologic significance of this disease? Morphologically, this is called a lymphonodular anterior uveitis or lymphocytic plasmacytic nodular anterior uveitis. Yes, there's a little bit of episcleritis and a little bit of scleritis here, but it's simply following the vascular outflow pathway, showing the scleral venous plexus very well. What does this mean? This is chronic antigenic stimulation, period. This is the lesion of periodic ophthalmia of horses. But this is also the lesion of idiopathic chronic uveitis in dogs and in cats and in cows and in pigs and in rabbits. So it has no etiologic significance. We keep struggling to find something. Does, is this what FIV does in a cat? Some people, their whole research career is based on proving that this is toxoplasmosis in a cat. Not so. This is a nonspecific reaction. What's interesting about it is those lymphocytes in those nodules, at least in experimental models, are polyclonal. They are not dedicated to whatever antigen initiated this. This lesion is a sequel, it is true, to a more exudative typical uveitis. You treat it with steroids and antibiotics and ketoconazole or whatever, it settles down and you end up with this kind of lesion in the eye. And every few months, the animal has an exacerbation of uveitis, typical periodic ophthalmia of horses, but the same pattern occurs in dogs and cats. What's the assumption? That the animal is getting re-exposure to leptospirosis or coccidioidomycosis or whatever? No. These lymphocytes are now primed to respond because they've been recruited, as lymphocytes are, into lymphoid nodules. They're, the cells there are not only cells carrying memory for the original antigen, but they're cells that are primed to recognize all kinds of antigens. So that theoretically, every time you vaccinate this cat, you could induce uveitis, because maybe there's a population of cells in there that are primed to recognize panleukopenia antigen, or kennel cough, or anything. Food antigens, flea bites might induce UV, uveitis. So that's a very important concept, that at this stage, this is an eye that has lost its immunologic privilege. The blood eye barrier, the normal eye contains no lymphocytes. The normal eye is protected from circulating disease by tight junctions at various levels at the level of limiting membranes and retina, at the level of vascular endothelium or epithelial tight junctions. 
the exact points aren't that important. In the event of any uveitis, that barrier will be lost. Ocular antigens leave the eye, systemic antigens enter the eye. And that barrier will not be reestablished for several months. So that during that period of time, the eye is very susceptible to recurrence of inflammation if the lymphocytes that have come into that eye as part of chronic inflammation are activated by the antigens to which they are uh, committed. So that I think we're on a, a it's, it's some bad thinking looking for the cause of that lesion. At this stage, who knows? Oh, just incidentally, um, this is a cat. This is the commonest cause of uveitis in cats. Shouldn't say that. The commonest lesion associated with uveitis in cats. If you go to the textbook and if you look up any species, it'll give you this, this mindless list. Uveitis in cats. Well, let's see. They will list uh, FIP, cryptococcosis, uh, toxoplasmosis, feline leukemia. Okay. What they don't mention is they together account for about 2%. This idiopathic lymphonodular uveitis accounts for the other 98. We hardly ever determine the etiology of uveitis in a cat, or a dog, or a horse. Same lesion occurs in rabbits. Don't know the cause. Hmm. Lucky this is an albino, uh, because you wouldn't be able to see this lesion otherwise. On the face of this iris, there is a tremendous vascular proliferation. And this is a relatively newly described entity in animals. Ten years ago, it was said not to occur. The human condition is called rubiosus iridis, reddening of the iris. Why can't they just call it reddening of the iris? Anyhow, rubiosus iridis. If you're trying to follow the notes, you notice I'm skipping around a little bit. The notes were intended for, I mean, they were written for you, but they're intended for your reading uh, separate from these slides. Rubiosus iridis is a pre iridal vascular membrane. It is granulation tissue. It is driven, we think, by the same mediators as granulation tissue. We know that these eyes that develop these pre iridal membranes have higher than normal levels of TGF-beta and fibroblast growth factor. The lesion itself is relatively simple. It is caused by a sprouting from iris vessels of endothelial tubes which penetrate the anterior of the iris and out into the anterior chamber and then grow along as a membrane across the iris surface. And they will then hollow out to form blood carrying channels since the mediators causing angiogenesis, as you know, are the same as those that cause fibroplasia, these are usually fibroendothelial membranes or fibrovascular membranes. And so you say, well, big deal. What's he spending time on this for? Here we have this membrane across the anterior face of the eye. Big deal. Well, let me tell you a clinical story. For years, we have known that animals with retinal detachment and animals with small intraocular tumors develop glaucoma. And we've never been able to figure out how a little ciliary body tumor occupying 5% of the mass of that globe causes glaucoma. When we analyze eyes with rubiosus iridis, we find out that the two leading causes of rubiosus iridis are retinal detachment and ciliary body tumors. And it turns out that what is happening is that detached retinas are ischemic. They've been pulled away from their choroidal blood supply. And the retina produces angiogenic stimulatory factors, presumably intended to re-nourish the retina by stimulating capillary sprouting in the retina itself. But alas, the eye is a fluid chamber. And bad planning. Those angiogenic factors enter the vitreous, which is liquefied usually, enter the aqueous and are floating around, they can't affect the blood vessels of the ciliary body because they're protected by epithelial tight junctions. 
But remember I told you the iris face has no tight junctions. It's in free communication with aqueous. So the growth factors intended for retina end up stimulating growth and proliferation of iris vessels which grow out onto the surface. And big deal. Well, the iris surface also includes the pectinate ligament. Here's Decimase membrane and corneal endothelium. Here's a pre-irritable fibrovascular membrane, and it has simply grown right across the face of the filtration angle. Glaucoma, endothelial tight junctions. It doesn't matter how thick this layer is. A single layer of endothelium with its tight junctions is a layer of saran wrap. Doesn't matter how thick it is, it's impermeable to aqueous. You get glaucoma. Ciliary body tumor, small tumor, but highly evolved epithelium. And epithelial tumors, as you know, produce lots of growth factor to support their own growth. Tumors are sneaky devils. They don't want to grow in excess of their vasculature. They create their own. But again, the tumor producing this seeps out into the aqueous and accidentally stimulates pre irritable fibrovascular membrane. This is now the second most common cause of glaucoma in dogs, second only to bad breeding practices and inherited maldevelopments of filtration angles. So rubiosus iridis in five years has gone from it doesn't happen in dogs and cats to the leading cause of glaucoma or second most common cause of glaucoma in dogs. It is the leading cause of glaucoma in horses. Let me just back up for a minute. The other thing that rubiosus iridis or pre irritable fibrovascular membrane does is causes hyphema. This is a fragile neovascular membrane and of course it bleeds. Let me take you back to another clinical axiom. If you see spontaneous, and this again, my experience is mostly in dogs and cats because that's where ophthalmology is right now, so I apologize for not using lab animal models, but I'm reminded dogs and cats are lab animals too. The axiom is if you see spontaneous unilateral hyphema in a dog or a cat, consider that that animal has intraocular neoplasia. That's written in all the clinical textbooks. Spontaneous unilateral hyphema, think tumor. For years we've said that without any idea at all why that is. Well, the why is this. The tumor causes rubiosus iridis, which then bleeds. So these eyes are enucleated for glaucoma or for intractable repeated hyphema. And therefore the suspicion there must be a tumor, let's get the eye out of there. And this is a pretty lesion. This is given a wonderful name. This is the pupillary margin. And this is the constrictor muscle. Here's the dilator muscle here, the constrictor muscle. And this iris arches upon itself. And it's arching backwards because this is the front of the iris. It has a pre irritable fibrous or fibrovascular membrane which runs through the pupil and around onto the back of the iris, causing this this misshapen pupil. It's called entropion UVA. Love that name, eh? Entropion, just like eyelids, bowing inward. UVA of the uvea. Very simple. If you're a, my first degree was in uh, philosophy and classical languages, so I'm in, I mean, ophthalmology suits me to a T. I was in training to be the Pope, but I discovered girls and it just was all over. <laughs> uh, so entropion U UVA, this isn't an important lesion. It does explain, though, why animals with chronic uveitis often have permanently irregular pupils, scallop pupillary margins. This is what you're looking at. When I mentioned the causes of rubiosus iridis, I, I omitted something and I shouldn't. If you look at what are the common causes, retinal detachment, ciliary body tumor, and chronic uveitis, because this is nothing more than granulation tissue. So obviously among, in addition to the kind of two special circumstances of tumor and detached retina, you have the ordinary circumstance of any chronic inflammation heals with the aid of granulation tissue. And here is wound healing in an unfortunate site, but it's just wound healing. So chronic uveitis also causes a pre irritable fibrovascular membrane or rubiosus iridis. What would be important about this lesion, in addition to blocking the filtration angle, giving rise to chronic hyphema, what if this hadn't gone around the back of the iris,
but had gone across the face of lens to the other iris. You would then have a pupillary block. So rubiosus iridis is significant in causing glaucoma in two different ways. Causing a pupillary block, then iris bombay and all that stuff, or by directly obliterating the filtration angle. Just to mention to you, here is a, this is on this particular picture, I think it's going to be hard to see from the back of the room. This is the optic disc and the retina is back here and this is a massive pre-retinal hemorrhaging fibrovascular proliferation. This is an example of the retinal detachment that actually does succeed in a sense in doing what it was intended to do, increase blood supply in the retina itself, but again, it's fragile and it bleeds easily. So we see pre-irrital membranes frequently, we see pre-retinal membranes quite infrequently. They're much more common in people because of diabetic retinopathy, which is vascular disease, the retina is ischemic, and they get pre-retinal membranes rather frequently, which then bleed. But we don't see that in, in uh, domestic animals or other laboratory animals very often. <clears throat> Am I going too quickly for you? I mean, just, you know, just holler, right? I've got uh, all kinds of time for questions. What's, what's wrong with this eye? This is, a, this is a formal and fixed eye, so it's, it looks a little different. It doesn't have coagulated protein. On the other hand, you can actually see things in it. Just another little incidental. If you're going to use formalin for fixation, and there's nothing wrong with it, its big problem is speed of penetration into the eye. What you can do is, is inject a quarter to a half a cc of formalin into the vitreous when you take the eye. Really useful. Mar you'd think that amount, like in a dog eye, I'm talking about half cc into a dog eye. <laughs> So prorate it downward, depending on the size of the eye. Uh, do it with a small needle so you don't detach the retina. Put it in with a 25-gauge needle or something. Just dribble it in there. And it's remarkable what a change that will make in terms of keeping the retina attached. Because the big problem with formalin fixation is it's not quick enough to fix the photoreceptors to keep them lock and key with the RPE, so the retina tends to flop off. Anyhow, what do you think is wrong with, with this eye? Look at the shape of the lens. Lens is anteriorly, posteriorly flattened. And almost always, well, always, that means a loss of lens substance. And that might be just in the course of a maturing cataract where it begins to liquefy and it dribbles, percolates out of that lens. But oops, here's lens, and here's lens, and this lens material is out of the lens capsule sitting over here among the ciliary processes. This is probably a lens perforation. And the next item I want to talk about is a disease called phacoclastic uveitis, which is, simply means lens rupture causing uveitis. I love that eye. Notice anything strange about th this eye? It's square. You know how an eye got square? This animal get caught in a crusher of some kind? No, that's an eye that wouldn't quite fit in a cassette. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, well, what can I say? It's a bit embarrassing, but it otherwise is a nice section. Um, in my mail-in practice, if you will, like, I mean, because I do eyes for nothing, my department chairman doesn't know that, and I'd appreciate it if you didn't mention that to him, um, uh, I get eyes mailed into me from all over the world, and this is at least the second most common perhaps even the most common lesion that I see. I said glaucoma a minute ago was the most common. Yes, it is, but this is probably the leading cause of glaucoma that I see because of my particular situation. This has a perilenticular inflammation. Everything seems to be adherent to this lens, and the lens itself has a very abnormal shape. But it has all the nice lesions of a subretinal serous exudate, complete retinal detachment, a plasmoid vitreous, a plasmoid aqueous, posterior synechia, iris bombay, anterior synechia. But it also has an odd thing of what looks like some kind of increased basophilia in central cornea, and it has at least focally here an anterior central synechia, right? Here's the iris coming up, adhering to a mass of something 
growing here at the central cornea. Lens rupture, most common cause, cat meets dog. New puppy in house with 12-year-old, firmly entrenched Siamese. That's where you see it. Okay. But you'll see it in hunting dogs, you know, running through thickets, and you'll see it with pellet gun wounds, uh, malicious, uh, uh, what are those, children, that's what they're called, yeah, shooting uh, pellets at dogs and cats. I've never taken care of, I mean, children and fox terriers, one might have a, no, only kidding. Anyhow, <laughs> uh, let's just... Move on a little bit. Okay, phacoclastic uveitis. Again, an entity that 10 years ago didn't occur. Didn't occur in domestic animals. Didn't occur in lab animals. Occurred only in people. I don't know why. No one had looked. They're all over the place. Really frequent. I should qualify that. They're really frequent for a pathologist to see. And why is that? Because they can't be treated successfully. The only treatment for lens rupture is to surgically remove the lens. These are eyes that there's been a traumatic injury. The owner brings them into the veterinarian for the acute traumatic uveitis. If you just even give an eye blunt trauma, you'll get an acute non-septic uveitis. Put it on steroids for a few days, the eye recovers, you're God, you're wonderful, charge them anything you want, they love you. Okay? However, 10 days or two weeks later, that traumatized eye comes back in with a second flare-up of uveitis that does not respond to steroids or anything that you can use. And the eye is lost, usually to glaucoma. The defect is an immunologic phenomenon where the ruptured lens releases into the eye a huge amount of lens protein. The textbooks will say erroneously that this lens protein is foreign and therefore it incites you know, a foreign body immune, uh, not a foreign body, a, a foreign tissue immune reaction. That's not true. Lens protein is not foreign. It shares at least eight antigens with other body tissues. It is well recognized by spleen as self. The trouble is it is recognized in small amounts. It is a low dose tolerance to lens antigen. It is when you rupture, massively rupture a lens and release a huge amount of it that you overcome splenic T-cell dependent low dose tolerance and you will then get a massive immunologic response within the eye to that lens protein. That is why small tears in lens will sometimes resolve. There's very early work being done at North Carolina. When this work first came out in the mid 80s about lens rupture, there are all kinds of experiments went on poking you know, 22 gauge needles through lenses terrible kind of research, trying to induce this. They couldn't do it because I think they need to take larger pieces out of it. This is a phenomenon that does occur, for example, after cataract surgery when you leave too much lens behind. You're accidentally reproducing lens rupture. However, the early lesion, let's, let's get down to the morphology. The sine qua non, the absolute requirement, is you demonstrate a capsular rupture. If by chance, and here's the lens capsule up front, and here's a big defect in it through which all kinds of leukocytes are pouring. Here is your lens being liquefied by these leukocytes. If by chance your section does not contain a capsular rupture, and after all it might be needle in a haystack looking for it, how can you determine capsular rupture? With absolute certainty, if you see one intralenticular leukocyte, you have capsular rupture. Absolutely. They're in the early stage, they are neutrophils. So if you see any intralenticular neutrophils, you have a capsular rupture. And that opens up lens-induced uveitis then as a possible explanation for the uveitis occurring in that eye. So the early stage is intralenticular leukocytes and a perilenticular neutrophil-dominated inflammation. This is not a diffuse uveitis. This is a very much a perilenticular disease we're talking about here. In people where this disease is called phacoanaphylactic uveitis, not a good name because it has nothing to do with anaphylaxis, it's not type 1 hypersensitivity. In people, the disease is described as being granulomatous in that here, we're just at the anterior border of lens, here are big globules of lens protein, here are some leukocytes, but this big ring 
this perilenticular ring of foamy macrophages is characteristic. Among all the animals I know of, the only one that has this is the rabbit. So the rabbit has a naturally, is a naturally occurring model for human phacoanaphylactic uveitis. It's really interesting to me that rabbits have spontaneous lens rupture. I now have a collection of 14 rabbits, all of them dwarf rabbits, with phacoclastic uveitis with this lesion. This is a rabbit with a granulomatous perilenticular inflammation that doesn't respond to any kind of therapy. These eyes are enucleated, every one of them. We don't know why. There is, these rabbits are sitting in a cage. There is absolutely no history of trauma. I've sectioned these corneas every which way. I cannot find a scar of penetration. But what these animals do have is they have intralenticular encephalitozoan. And we are speculating, and it is rampant speculation, that encephalitozoan somehow is associated with weakening of the capsule and spontaneous rupture. We don't know how they get there. We don't know if it's vertical transmission. How would they penetrate a huge thick lens capsule? Well, they probably can't. But they could probably penetrate the very thin lens capsule or non-existent lens capsule of the embryo. So it might be that it's in utero infection uh, and they're intralenticular right from the start. So we do not know exactly what happens, but it's the only lead that we have. Encephalitozoan has been reported to cause cataract. As far as I can tell from the paper, that was, again, only an association. Oh, look, rabbit has cataract. Oh, look, there's intralenticular encephalitozoan. Let's put them together. But they had no more proof of that than I do of this. In all other species, lens-induced uveitis takes a remarkable turn. I think because they are so heavily treated with steroids and antibiotics and all kinds of other anti-metabolites, that what we see in the eye that's nucleated is this lesion. We don't usually see the, the massive inflammatory disease. What we see is the capsular tear, a little bit of capsular proliferative activity trying to repair itself, and an anterior lens epithelium that has slipped out of the lens and is now growing as a plaque on the anterior face of lens around the lens, across the pupil, and into the anterior chamber. Phacoclastic uveitis in its initial stage is an inflammatory disease, but when it destroys the eye, it is the result of wayward proliferation of lens epithelium thinking it's healing the defect, but it does it outside of the lens. This is a PAS, and you notice this PAS positive material? This is basement membrane. It tells you this is lens epithelium trying to make lens capsule. Fibroblasts do not do this. These cells retain the immunohistochemical profile of lens epithelium. They're not fibroblasts. So the disease that destroys the eye, usually via glaucoma, is because of this proliferation of lens epithelium. I'm not saying there won't be some fibroblasts involved from the uvea. Of course, there might be but it's mostly lens epithelium growing on the face of the lens, obstructing pupillary flow. They can grow all over the anterior chamber. They can obstruct filtration angles. They can grow back into the vitreous. But basically, you're talking about a pupillary block because of proliferating capsular epithelium. And this is the kind of thing that I would routinely get. This is a horse. No species is immune to this. I've seen it in everything. I've seen it in birds, raptors particularly. When, when raptors are young, I mean, they fly into things. Uh, I'm told peregrine falcons are inf infamous. I mean, they're zooming around, these young ones, zooming around like crazy, but going into trees all the time. Again, big eyes, no brains, right? Remember that. Okay. So here we have a, a rupture in Decimase's membrane. Decimase membrane, elastic, incredibly tough. The only way you're going to break a decimase membrane is penetrating injury. It would be very rare for anything else to do that, except mycotic keratitis in a horse will lyse it, but beyond that. So we have evidence for a penetrating injury. There's, there's an iris adhesion at that site, 
and there's a massive proliferation here where the uveal tract, the iris, seems to be all distorted and bound up in some kind of proliferative phenomenon. Here's this wrinkled posterior capsule, wrinkled because it's lost lens mass, and here's a break here, in this case, one in the posterior capsule, one in the anterior. How do you tell a genuine capsular break from a fake? You can do, you know, I mean, you can accidentally, in trimming and that, you can break capsules. How do you tell the genuine capsule, when it breaks, will develop A, rounded edges, and B, will almost always coil? So this break here is suspect as not being genuine, but this coiling is, and if we had higher power, we'd find these ends to be rounded. So this is probably not genuine, not with the ragged edges like this. But this is the typical obliterative end stage of a lens rupture with lens epithelial proliferation. This, by the way, is also the main complication of cataract surgery. If you're, a cata if you're a cataract surgeon and you're doing the usual dog or cat type cataract, your main worry is you go in there with a vacuum after you've taken out most of that cataractous lens material and you vacuum the whole inside of that capsular bag that you've left in place. Why? To get every scrap of lens epithelium out of there. Because if you leave any behind, it's going to proliferate. And for years, we've battled the fibrous, scarring consequences of cataract surgery that cause pupillary obstruction. And the villain is lens epithelium. If you want to treat this medically, what you need to do is treat it like you're dealing with a fibrosarcoma. You need to treat it with cancer drugs. And even then, you're likely to lose. We're just about ready for break. Is that right? Five minutes, three minutes, whatever. You'll stand up and yell. Let me deal with one more thing before the break. And this is a really neat disease. This is, this is traumatic sarcoma in a cat. And I'm going to, going to move just to the very edge of where veterinary ophthalmology is, is investigating this. In a dog, if you rupture the lens, you'll get this proliferating lens epithelium and cause pupillary blocks and all that terrible stuff. And that's serious enough. But you can enucleate the eye if you're quick, you can just take the lens out, no problem. In a cat, in an unknown percentage of cats with ruptured lenses, they will evolve into sarcomas. For reasons we don't understand, cats develop soft tissue tumors at sites of trauma. That we're in the middle of a virtual epidemic of vaccine-induced fibrosarcomas in cats all over the world. In the past four years, we have had 492 fibrosarcomas in the skin of cats at vaccination sites. They're seen in Holland, they're seen in Russia, they're seen all over the world. Before that, we noticed this happening in eye, that amid the fibrous-like proliferation that dogs get, cats start to develop bad things. They start to develop hyperchromasia and bizarre giant cells, and they turn their fibrous metaplasia of lens epithelium into a fibrosarcoma, chondrosarcoma, osteosarcoma. They're called post-traumatic sarcomas because the type of sarcoma is not predictable. Sometimes the same eye contains several variants. We do not know what percent of traumatized eyes are destined to do this. These are highly malignant. They are probably all going to kill the cat given enough time. Current data says about a 60% metastatic rate. They habitually grow in an unusual fashion. They grow circumferentially within the eye. They encircle the uvea, and then they move outward, and they kill by moving into brain. It's not usually metastatic disease that kills. They are so locally invasive that they go into brain. These are very bad news. Recommendation in a cat, if it's got a ruptured lens, you nucleate the, the eye. Don't mess around with it. This is what they look like. This is a bit atypical. This is fill the anterior chamber, but usually they'll move around as a massive thickening, and then they'll go right through the optic nerve, optic frame, and into brain. 